So, just uh, for your intellectual amusement <laughs> and for your um, elucidation, uh, we're going to be reading a few passages from the word of the Buddha, uh, anthology of suttas. Um, so, no microphone, indeed. So I've got to get that one here. Yeah. So. Um, excuse me, I'm deaf. Maybe the deaf. I can't hear what you're saying. Yeah. Yes, I didn't have the microphone. For this one, I probably might need a stand or something yeah. because I can't scroll and. Yeah. Or a stand. Yeah. <coughs> I can start like this, but even this one's not working. Yes, it's actually. Oh, no. Anyone there? <laughs> Nothing can turn on. Ah. Ah, oh, yes. I can just see what we can do here. So just to start about um, introduction. And this is not from the suttas, this is my introduction to what I'm going to talk about the next couple of days. In 1907, the pioneering German born monk Velabonyana Taloka published the English version of the Word of the Buddha in 1907. That's 112 years ago. It is described as an outline of the teachings of the Buddha in the words of the Pali Canon. It consists of a series of authentic teachings from the suttas that expound on the core of the Buddhist Dhamma of the Four Noble Truths, including the Noble Eightfold Path. For almost 20 years I had been using the word of the Buddha as a textbook to introduce my monastic students to the Buddhist suttas. Indeed, every Anagarika, as a postulant, and Samanera, a novice, must complete this course in basic <coughs> Buddhist teaching before they are allowed to receive the high, higher ordination as a bhikkhu. I have taken such steps to establish QC, quality control, in a monks under my training. So, at the very least, they are made aware of what the Buddha really taught from the most reliable source, the Sutta. Unfortunately, there is a problem. Although the Dhamma is timeless, the usual presentation has become as if overgrown by impenetrable thickets of tradition. I have received countless well-intended criticisms that all the repetitions are discouraging. The similes are so archaic as to be obtuse, and some revered renderings of key Buddhist terms are rusted shut. The explanations are well past their use by date. And there is an ancient Chinese saying, rather turn on an electric light than complain about darkness. Now this is an example of how you change things. Instead of the usual one, rather light a candle than complain about darkness, how many people would complain about darkness and light a candle? They would turn the switch to turn the electric lights on, as Venerable Chanda just did. And this is an ancient Chinese saying, updated. So this little book, which one day gets published, is not just another translation, it's a new type of translation, not so much for detached scholars, but for those who immerse their whole lives in these teachings. And I have followed Professor A.K. Warder's insightful advice that, quote, it is the sentences which are the natural units of discourse, and which are the minimum units having precise fully articulated meaning. For purposes of study, we have to assign approximate meanings to words and list these in vocabularies. 
for these generalized meanings of words are extremely vague, whereas sentences have exact meanings. In translation one may find close equivalent for sentences, while it is often impossible to give close equivalent for words. Here we go. And that should be good. Yeah. That's that's better. You can all hear okay? Thank you. So in other words, that uh, little passage uh, from a Professor Ward of Cambridge University uh, was that translators should always translate sentence for sentence, never word for word. And the obvious example of that is it was raining very heavily a couple of days ago over in uh, Devon. There's a big storm, <coughs> the edge of the storm, which was happening in, over in Wales. Apparently there's still some floods over there. So, when we were over in Gaia House, it was raining cats and dogs. You all understand what that means, don't you? But I never saw any cat fall from the sky. <laughs> Not any dog come smashing into the gutters. But if we do translate word for word, that's what happens. We miss the meaning, because it's a sentence, a phrase, which is the minimum unit of language, not the sentence, not, so not the, the word for word. So that's one of the reasons why, when I've done this translation, it was phrase by phrase, sentence by sentence not word for word. And it's also sometimes that I have changed the similes, keeping the meaning, but keep the, uh, change some of the words in order that uh, it makes the similes far more powerful, such as the simile of the uh, which is well known by Buddhists, of being a person being shot by an arrow and a person asks, what type of arrow is this? Uh, who shot the arrow? What caste did they come from? Where they <laughs> and the Buddha says the person would die before that they could actually receive any treatment. And I just changed that simile to a person was shot with a bullet and they call the medics and the medics the guy says to them what type of bullet was this and uh, who shot me and are you accredited medics <laughs> do you come are you part of the National Health Service do I have to pay something and of course you know that's the sort of conversation you may have but the it brings to light that instead of, if you were shot and injured, you would never just go and ask such questions. You get the, the, uh, the, the wound treated first of all, and then afterwards you ask those questions. So it's an example of similes which you can keep the meaning, but change the context, change some of the words in order to make it far more powerful far more meaningful, and to fulfill the Buddha's intentions when he made these great similes. <coughs> so, this little book is not another translation. Okay, let's see, word for word. Thus, in order to convey the meaning, I have chosen to translate sentence for sentence and not word for word. A word has no permanent essence outside of a sentence. My authority to translate so it's from my reputation as a well-known Buddhist meditation teacher, trained to think in Cambridge University, and then trained to be silent for nine years under Ajahn Shah, an author of many books. Uh, and living 45 years, immersed in the life of a renunciate, open to scrutiny. By open to scrutiny, I mean that uh, you can even uh, go and look at my bedroom where I live in Bodhinyana Monastery. I'm one of the few Buddhist monks 
whose bedroom is a tourist attraction. <laughs> How many of you have been to Perth and seen my bedroom? Okay, just two or three of you. <laughs> so what does my bedroom look like, Jake? Oh, very comfortable, simple. Yeah. It was what? a cave. It's a cave, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's where I actually live. <laughs> so anyway, so that you're not hiding anything. For example, for many years I have consistently protested against the traditional translation of concentration for the Pali word Samadhi. I've already mentioned that to you. The reason I do that is because when we talk about concentration that really does um, <coughs> cause a lot of the um, a lot of problems for people trying too hard getting stressed out and never just enjoying the meditation stillness instead of concentration this is not a trivial point for debate among philologists for it cuts to the very heart of the Buddhist path to freedom nor is my protest to serve an ego quite the opposite the practice of concentration and the willpower on which it depends actually reinforces the ego. The more you will, the more you exist. The bigger is your sense of self. On the contrary, stillness and the letting go of enunciation which it depends brings the ego to cessation. And anyway, I'm now going to that's just a little introduction there about this type of translation. Now of course there's no way that we can uh, read through the whole of uh, what I've written here but because this is a meditation retreat I wanted to point out that the, the usual Eightfold Path though there is uh, many things which we miss when we have translations which are not really that accurate such as um, such as the uh, translation for samadhi as stillness which it doesn't really deserve and just I just was scrolling down here to get to where I wish to be that wanting is my preferred translation for tanha usually translated as craving the word craving is a very intense form of wanting but even the small types of wanting, those are the ones which stop one being able to let go and being free. So sometimes people say, oh, I'm not craving for things. I can give up smoking cigarettes any time, but just I don't want to right now. So in other words, they're still wanting, but they're not really seeing just the power of even <coughs> small amounts of wanting. So. Uh, I'm going to start the, the Eightfold Path not with the right view but the next um, part, of the second factor of the Eightfold Path which I'll do reasonably fast is Samma Sankhapa now many people will automatically remember this they call it right intention even they say right thought which to me is very weird because if it's concentration may be thought if it is stillness it is thought which disturbs the tranquility of the mind so instead of calling it right thought which is certainly something which doesn't fit at all even in right intention there is something else which is a much better um, translation right motivation in, I learned this when I was studying the Pali discipline called the Vinaya and was very pleased to see that this is reflected even in Western law. Are there any lawyers here? Yeah, great. So when we have uh, the motivation is where you're coming from. What actually made you do that? The intention is where the, the act 
is meant to lead to. So if you look at the act, the whatever you said or did, you said, why did you do that? Where was it coming from? Was it coming from, from craving or from lust or from ill will or just basic stupidity? And the intention is, where was it leading to? What did you uh, expect to get from that? And it's quite clear from the Buddha's definition of the second factor in the Eightfold Path, Samasankhapa, that it refers to your motivation. Not what you intend to achieve, but where these intentions are coming from. <coughs> so, what is right motivation? The three Samasankhapas. Sankha, and it's, it's actions of body, speech, and mind arriving from, arousing from, so arising from renunciation, otherwise called letting go, from kindness and from gentleness. That's a Nekama Sankhapa, a Wayapada Sankhapa, and a Hingsaka Sankhapa. Now, for those of you who don't know exactly what those words mean. Nekama is a renunciation, letting go. You may remember that Awayapada is a simile for metta. And one of the reasons why I focused on this is because when I looked at the Eightfold Path, I thought, where is compassion and kindness in this Eightfold Path? And when you look at it superficially, you can't see kindness, metta, mentioned anywhere in the Eightfold Path. But when you look a bit closer, especially in the second factor of the Eightfold Path, what I call right motivation, you see it right there as the second factor of the second part of the Eightfold Path. The right kindness. The motivation. So you're motivated by a wire part of non-hatred, kindness, gentle, and the third one is gentleness. Ahingsaka, non-violence. And of course, many people can recognize that word, ahingsa. It was made very famous by Mahatma Gandhi. And there we have it in the third of the second factor of the Eightfold Path. Ahingsaka, Sankapa. So, now we make this right intention, where you're coming from, why are you doing this, why are you meditating? Is it to get something? That's not nekama. That is trying to attain things. Nekama is letting go. Are you doing this uh, with force, hating your defilements? trying to get rid of stuff. That is not loving-kindness. That is control. Are you doing this with ahingsaka, being gentle to your body? Unfortunately, though there is a tendency for people in spiritual life to think that you have to be fierce on your body you can't give in, you've got to sit for hours in order to break through. In other words, that you have to force the body. And unfortunately, uh, in my life, I've seen many monks try to do that. And even Ajahn Chah tells them, you're going too hard. Slow down, be kind to your body, be gentle to your body. And that is part of the Eightfold path, being gentle. Gentleness also means being patient. Just like I said with that story of the migrant working and had to wait till Friday before he was paid. The check's coming, but you have to be very, very gentle and patient. So motivation coming from letting go. I was also going to add that Ajahn Chah would say again and again and again and again, <coughs> rummed it into me, that we meditate to let go of things, not to attain things. We meditate to let go of things, not to attain things. 
Because if you want to attain something, that wanting will be your obstacle. And you just get frustrated. But when we learn how to let go of things, to let go of wanting, just that it outs, be kind, be gentle, that all those things we wanted will come to us. That's right motivation. And when we have the right motivation of letting go kindness and gentleness, or sometimes, sometimes that to change the word from uh, from renouncing, because it really means the opposite of trying to get something. I try sometimes call it make peace. And sometimes you might see a calendar somewhere on sale. <laughs> or somewhere for donations, for Anukampa. And the first saying in there is, make peace, be kind, be gentle. And you say, where does that come from? That comes from not Ajahn Brahm. I translated that, but it comes from the Lord Buddha. It's the second part of the Eightfold Path. And there we have the kindness, compassion, front and central, at the very beginning of our Buddhist path. <coughs> and of course, when we have that compassion, that letting go, that gentleness, that kindness, then of course, the next three factors of the Eightfold Path, which I, will go th I won't go through, uh, right speech, right action, right livelihood. You can see they are based on the right motivations. If your motivation is pure, in other words, you're coming from letting go, from renunciation, you're coming from kindness and gentleness. Of course, all the precepts are just fall into place effortlessly. Which is what happens when you're not wanting things. You're not wanting to get rich. You're not wanting to be powerful or to be famous. You're doing this just to let go. And you're being kind and kindness and gentleness is so central to your speech, action and livelihood. Thereby you can see how these things start to fit together. But then after the right speech, right action and livelihood, we have what's called Samawayama. What does that mean? The usual translation is right effort. Is that a good translation? I know people who have been putting effort into trying to focus their attention on their breath for decades. And one of the first people to do that recorded was <coughs> Siddhartha Gautama. It was six years prior to sitting under the Bodhi tree. Huge amounts of effort and striving and struggle. And what did happen? Only frustration. Effort is what you use to actually get success in the world. But if you want, if you aspire, if you are led to go another direction, the direction of renunciation, we don't use effort. We use something a little bit more profound. So I've struggled to find a decent translation for Samawayama, the sixth factor of the Eightfold Path, and eventually come to right restraint. And the reason I say that, right restraint, is because there is a parallel path called the gradual training, taught by the Buddha many times, especially in the first suttas of the Adiga Nikaya. It's called the, just the gradual training. And there, you know, we have the moralities in detail about you know, what one shouldn't do. This was especially for a monk of an arm. And then we have establishing mindfulness, actually just uh, knowing the purpose of what one is doing. And then we have restraint of the senses. And after restraint of the senses, then we have the jhanas. And in each one of these you can see this is not a different path to the Eightfold Path. 
another way of expressing it. And where the Eightfold Path has Samawayama, right, what people call effort, the gradual training has right restraint. It's one of the reasons why just choosing that as the preferred translation. Of course, restraint does take effort. Stop it. I can't resist telling anecdotes, but one of the real anecdotes was of a little <coughs> novice monk in Wat Ba Pong many years ago. And those of you who come from traditional Buddhist countries know that if a, a young boy uh, loses the, f the father or the mother, if uh, the family can't look after them, the, the monastery, the temple was like a, a almost like an orphanage. And there the uh, temple would look after the young kids until usually they were 16 or 17, giving them an education, a home, and then they would just leave to slow and eventually just go back to the world. They'd be looked after and educated for that while. So we did have these very little monks who didn't decide to become monks because they wanted to. If basically they had no choice. That was in the old days. But anyway, there was this one young fellow, maybe about 10 or 11 years of age, at Wat Ba Pong, when Ajahn Chah was giving one of his long talks, <laughs> which sometimes lasted all night. And this young little kid, 10 or 11 years of age, a novice monk, he, was, he had to attend as well, and he was listening to Ajahn Chah's uh, sermon, and he was getting more and more bored, and he started thinking, when is Ajahn Chah going to stop? When is he going to stop? When is he going to stop? It became like one of those repeated phrases in those, those old vinyl LPs where you had a scratch in them. <laughs> when is he going to stop? And Ajahn Chah was droning on. When is Ajahn Chah going to stop? Was droning on in the novice's mind. Until there was a moment of insight. The insight is turning things the other way around. Seeing things from a different angle. His insight was when am I going to stop? And that novice stopped. When he opened his eyes, it was already dawn. All the monks had left the hall. They'd done their bowing, their chanting, putting all their stuff away. And this little novice just had his first beautiful deep meditation. He'd stopped. He got jhana. That it's one of the most wonderful teachings. Stop. One of the reasons why I say that Buddhism is very prevalent in UK. You can see it at every red traffic light intersection where you look at the sign and it tells you to stop. Not give way, <coughs> but to stop. Reminding you of the deepest teachings of the Buddha. Stop. Anyway, <laughs> that is what happens when you restrain. You stop. So anyway, <coughs> I'm now going to read my translation of right restraint. What now is right restraint? There are these four right restraints. This is in the Ankuta and Nikaya. Guarding, abandoning, developing, and preservation. What is the restraint of guarding? When you see an object, you do not let yourself get sucked in by any characteristics or features that generate defilements. Since if you left the faculty of sight unrestrained, unskillful states of wanting and aversion would afflict you. Instead, you practice wisdom when seen. <coughs> You guard the faculty of sight and you undertake the restraint of sight. It's a young monk, only 23 when I ordained, 
and sometimes you would see beautiful girls come into the monastery. So what did you do? You know, this was a chemical reaction, it was your, your conditioning, hormones would start sort of bubbling up or whatever they do. So, whenever I saw a beautiful Thai girl come into the monastery, I would not look for the part of her which was the most attractive. I would look, please excuse me, but this is just what I did. I look for her pimples. <laughs> Try and find a zit somewhere. <laughs> when I did that, that I wasn't focusing on the part which it says here. Would, uh, if I left my faculty of sight unrestrained, unskillful states of wanting would actually come up in my mind. And the same if there was someone who was an enemy or someone I didn't like. I would restrain my sight so I try to see something in them which would not generate aversion. So I wouldn't look at their features in them or their speech, you know, which would uh, make me mad at them. So that was my restraint of the senses. I didn't realize you know, what I was doing at the time, but that was actually what I was up to, which means I was peaceful. Uh, people who had I remember seeing this poor young boy in Medan and who had a, a brain tumour which actually pushed itself right through his eyeball. So had this little column of tumour coming out of his, of his eye. Gross thing to see, but I made sure that you know, he was obviously suffering and, and probably not long to live, but still, you actually don't look at the part of that which creates aversion but look for something else in that kid which generates compassion. It's called a restraint of the senses, guarding them. And that's the same with the other senses, hearing a sound, noticing a smell, sense a taste, felt a bodily feeling, cognize something with the mind. You do not let yourself get sucked in by any characteristics or features that generate defilements. Since you've left the mind faculty unrestrained, unskillful states of wanting and aversion would afflict you. Instead you practice wisdom with the mind, you guard the mind, and you undertake restraint of the mind. That is called the restraint of guarding the senses. That is, some people say, well that does take some sort of effort, but it's not the effort to attain something. It's the effort to stop things, to stop the defilements. <coughs> and of course, there is the second of the Samoyamas, restraint of the five hindrances by abandoning. What is restraint by abandoning? Here you do not maintain, maintain an arisen thought of wanting. You abandon it, let it go, renounce it, bring it to cessation. You do not indulge an arisen thought of aversion, arisen thought of harming. Because when bad thoughts arise, you abandon them and let them go. Renounce them and bring them to cessation. This is called a restraint by abandoning. So when you do have like series of bad thoughts, you know, which you know, can sometimes come up. What am I doing this for? It's wrong to be in this temple. I should be out there doing something else. <coughs> or you get angry because somebody else bangs the door just when you're about to get jhanas. Or somebody uh, goes to sleep. Why do you allow people to go to sleep in this temple? Shouldn't do so. They should have bedrooms for that. When you have those arisen thoughts of aversion, you renounce those thoughts. You find a way to actually <coughs> to not have those arisen thoughts, which you know that just are very hurtful to both you and to others. So, that is called a restraint by abandoning. And of course, part of that is a very well known uh, how to deal with distracting thoughts. So when you do have um, some negative thoughts or thoughts of lust or craving, for example, which is, was it, 4.30 now, and you're not going to have to be able to eat again until tomorrow morning. Oh. <laughs> so how can you deal? <laughs> deal with like such thoughts, so that you're mindful of some other object and there, if there arises in uh, 
you disturb and troublesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, delusion, then you should give attention to some other object that generates peaceful mind states. Thus disturbing thoughts are abandoned and subside. With their disappearance your mind becomes internally steady, settled, unified and still. So whenever I got sort of wanting more food, I used to think of the food which I ate and just where it came from or where it's going to go to. And uh, especially where it's going to go to. Sometimes I would look at my rice and curry and look in there that somewhere in there, somewhere in there, I couldn't see it, but somewhere in there was the feces and urine which would come out afterwards. <laughs> my body would take the energy and the vitamins and stuff to maintain my body. And the leftover stuff would be, you know, what's flushed down the toilet. But that stuff flushed down the toilet had to be in there somewhere. <laughs> so I'd look at my food and say, well, I can't see it, but in there somewhere <laughs> is the... <laughs> and I'd only do that, you know, if I was really, really hungry, or well, not really hungry, but really <laughs> desiring really lots and lots of food. When I did that, you know, it took away a lot of, <laughs> of the, the attraction to food. So little tricks of the trade or something, but if you're not eating enough, then of course, you know, in that food which you have on your plate, you're looking at all the, the energy and the health which that food is going to be giving you. It empowers you to do wonderful things in this life, to serve to help, to care. So if you have some... Actually, you see my shape, I found out what I have. But why I'm quite um, tubby in the middle. You know what it's called? It's called anorexia. Because <laughs> one day I looked in the dictionary, the Oxford English Dictionary. Definition of anorexia is you look in the mirror and you think you're fat. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I won't go there. <laughs> so you give some object to attention to some other objects that generates peaceful mind states. Thus, disturbing thoughts of abandon will subside. With their disappearance, your mind becomes internally stead steady, settled, unified, and still. In other words, that, that you don't inflame the mind. Or you should examine the danger in those thoughts. You know, sometimes that we think that, oh, okay, we're just playing. It's not really important. It's not really going to cause trouble to us. You know, when I think of all the ways that uh, I can get my own back at that person, that person who just took the last scone from lunch. <laughs> but you know, sometimes that if you think negative thoughts like that, they're dangerous. Because the more you think like that, the more it becomes just how you relate to life. It's worth the training to actually to try and see the danger in just uh, unwholesome thoughts of wanting and uh, ill will. Or you should just simply try to ignore those disturbing thoughts and not give attention to them. Ah, they're just thoughts, they will go away. This is exactly where Ajahn Chah would say, it's not the noise disturbs you, it's you who disturb the noise. And it means that there may be people talking, chatting, there may be a party going on next door, and then, does it disturb your meditation? Or does the thinking about it and attending on it give you more disturbance? The simile of somebody banging the door as they come in and leave this um, meditation hall. Why did they bang the door? They've got no right to, they're totally insensitive. Don't they know this is a meditation retreat? Even burglars can come in and out without banging the door and we allow these people to come in and bang the door. I'm going to find out who it is. I'm going to tell the uh, manager of this retreat so to get them banned next time. 
find out who they are, make sure that they never get allowed to come in this retreat again until they learn how to, to, to close the doors quietly. And the banging of the door, that sound disappeared a long time ago. But you carry on thinking about it for minutes after minutes after minutes and that's what disturbs your meditation. Not the sound itself, but your reaction to it. <coughs> it's what I can charm meant. But it's not the sound disturbs you. You disturb the sound. <coughs> and one of the best, you should give attention to studying the causes that created those thoughts. Have you ever been meditating, you're quite still, and a thought comes from nowhere? And I didn't create that thought, it just came. Yeah, sure. Because the truth of the matter is, you have to admit it, you know, after a while I, you know, why do these thoughts keep coming into my mind? And so I was more mindful, more powerful mindfulness, and see that I went out there to choose this thought and bring it in. Stupid thoughts, any old thought would do. In the same way that when I was a school teacher, I was so tired after teaching high school kids all day, that I went back to my room and I just, first thing, just make a cup of tea quickly and just sit down there, Ugh. and I turn on the TV, kids program, stupid program, I didn't care what it was, because <laughs> just the time to distract myself. This is what happens, that when we are bored, distracted, when we want an escape, we choose a thought. You may not see this, it may be subconscious anything to take you away from being peaceful. In Australia, such large areas of land, so peaceful, even the animals don't make much sound. So, it's one of the quietest places in the world. But sometimes I've seen visitors, when they come into such quiet places, they raise their voice. They speak more loudly than they would in the city. And often wondered why. Often it's because the silence challenges them. They can't handle peace. It's one of the reasons why. They want to bring in some noise, something. Because peace, quietness, stillness is a threat to them. It's a threat to your very being. So every time I don't pay attention to this, I touch something and it and a scream goes. Okay, gone really gone. So anyway, that that's um, uh, finding the causes for these things. When your mind wanders away, when you're trying to watch the breath and it keeps wandering away, why? Why can't my mind just be still on the object? And the reason is, is I found out that it's because my mind and I didn't have a very good relationship. So much so, as soon as my mind saw me coming, it was off. It escaped somewhere. And it brought back those little stories. I told one story about the mother who had the five or six year old child who had an argument with uh, the mummy and said, Mummy, I don't love you anymore. And I recall telling that same story to a, a Singapore psychologist who was about to come to UK actually to do um, a course in psychology to get the right accreditations sponsored by my group in Singapore so that she could uh, come back to Singapore and practice for the benefit of the community. When I told her that story, because she was meditating and mine would be wandering all over the place, I told her story and she was being not really disrespectful, she couldn't help herself. She was holding her belly laughing and she started rolling on the floor. And I said, why? What's happening here? And she told me there's such a similar story. In one of the, the blocks of flats, the high-rise flats, 
over in Singapore that she also had an argument with her mother and she too said mummy I can't stand you anymore I, I don't love you anymore I'm leaving so a six-year-old girl leaving home for the first time and this six-year-old girl in Singapore the reason why she was laughing when I told the other story which I told a few days ago in Thinking Guy House there was almost exactly the same with just a few differences <coughs> The mother also helped her pack a bag. But in the Australian story, the mother actually gave the daughter, the son in this case, uh, made him a sandwich for lunch. But here in Singapore, the mother gave her daughter a 20 sing doll note to buy her own lunch. <coughs> you know Singapore? I love Singaporeans, but there was something very Singaporean in that. <laughs> <laughs> but and it wasn't down the garden path she went to the elevator, the lift and pressed the ground floor button and the mother was at the outside of the lift door saying bye bye darling, have a wonderful life please keep in touch and the little six year old went to the bottom floor the ground floor and even by that time the little six year old was homesick you know what it's like to be, we may you know what it's like five or six years of age. And so she managed to reach up and press the button for the floor on which she lived. And the elevator of the lift went up, and as the doors opened at the floor where she lived, the mother was waiting outside. She knew what would happen. Welcome home, darling. Do you have a nice <laughs> <laughs> That is how to stop the causes of a wandering child, a wandering mind. <coughs> Let it go. Be kind to it. Mind if you want to go, off you go. Have a wonderful time. I'll be here when you come back. But if you say, don't go. This is my meditation retreat. I've only got two or three days. It's really hard to get on these retreats. <coughs> you behave. You know, I've, I've told all the other people about this. And I'm sure they, when I go home, they're going to ask me, yeah, what do you do? Do you get jhanas? Do you get nimittas? What do you get? And I say, oh, well, 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 no. And they say, oh, you're hopeless, you're stupid. And so you tell them, like, mind, I'm not going to allow you to wander off. This is it. That type of ill will. No loving kindness to your mind. No gentleness. That's where the thoughts come from. Anything, anything to escape. Stupid thoughts, stupid plans for the future, fantasies. What would you do if you win the lottery? Take it from me, you won't. <laughs> <coughs> so why think about it? Something to do, isn't it? It's because we don't value the peace. But it's also the mind, mind and us, we don't get along. So be kind to your mind. Say, so mind, if you want to fall asleep, fine by me. If you, if you want to wander off, that's okay. I'll be here for you. The beautiful kindness. It's like your mind thinks, who would want to wander away from someone like this? They become your best friend. When you're having time with your best friend, do you really want to run away? But if you're with, a, with an enemy, you can't get away soon enough. Any excuse will do. So that is, that is actually um, stilling the causes that created those thoughts. And lastly, this is only in emergencies. Number five, you should clench your teeth with your tongue pressed against the roof of your mouth and beat down, constrain and crush any such disturbing, troublesome thoughts. You try that. <laughs> and the thoughts win. Have a, you want to try it, but the other ones are the best. So this is restraint by abandoning. Or the restraint by developing. <coughs> So the restraint by developing things 
As you develop, they call it here the enlightenment factors, mindfulness. If you develop mindfulness, that's another way. You can see what's happening, so these thoughts don't invade the mind and remain. Exploring the Dhamma. Sometimes we call this contemplation, reflecting. But reflecting and contemplating is too much thinking. So I call it exploring, where you try and see things you've never seen before. Look at things from a different angle. Explorer. What's this I'm holding up? Well, you can speak now. What is this? What else is it? What else? An overture. What else? What else? So there's no right answer. Don't think that you're going to get me to say, yes, you've got it, wonderful. <laughs> there's no right answer, but the more I ask you to look, the more you see. That's called exploring. Sometimes what happens in life, we hold it up, your glass of water, finish with it, done. Yeah, I've got it right. No, keep on looking, see what else you see. And the more you look, the more you see. Until you've you totally right, gone past everything you've ever been taught. Anything you've ever been, been uh, expected this thing to be. And you can see something else which you've never seen before. Such as the visual aid for teaching what stillness is. <laughs> <laughs> so this is when you explore things. Exploration does not stop but ideas you already know. It goes past that, deeper, into stillness, past all those words and descriptions, way past your learning, to see things in a new way. Exploration. And another factor of energy, rapture, tranquility, stillness, equanimity. And each one of these based on seclusion, fading away, cessation, nurturing, in release. So when you develop the beautiful factors, of course the negative factors can't come up at all. So that's one of the ways of restraining those negative factors. And even simple things, like because when you get into deep meditation, naturally you get so much energy it's very common that you won't be able to sleep. You don't need to sleep. Your mind is buzzing. It's perfectly healthy. <coughs> when you meditate very often, you don't need as much sleep as when you're working and being stressed out. And sometimes that when you really get into the deep meditations, after you come out, you're like walking on air, so happy, so joyful, that there's very difficult to go to sleep. You lay down, rest the body, but no sleepiness at all. And anyway, what is the restraint of the five hindrances by maintaining a positive mind state? Here you keep in mind an arisen mental object that generates stillness, such as recollecting the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, or a state of uh, some object which generates um, kindness and gentleness, sometimes like your acts of generosity, loving kindness. These are called restraining by maintaining. So that becomes like what I call the four right efforts. I'm not trying to get something, but trying to let go, stop, and in order to restrain the wanting and aversion, which are the first two of the five hindrances. And that is one of the reasons why, when one does the right restraint, what starts to disappear is these things we call the five hindrances. The five hindrances, just in brief, wanting, aversion, sloth and torpor, the tiredness. I already mentioned that when you restrain these, uh, patterns right restraint, you get energized, you're not wasting energy wasting energy in wanting something and figuring out how you're going to get it, in uh, ill will and figuring out 
How you going to get your own back on that person or whatever? That's where sloth and torpor comes from. You use your mind over much. You're tired. And unfortunately, this retreat is too too short to really get in to overcoming sloth and torpor. In the longer retreats, the nine-day retreats, for those of you who have attended those nine-day retreats which I've led, the first couple of days I tell people, <coughs> go to bed, sleep a lot, because you have sleep deficit. And the classic story about that was when this um, executive from Sydney came to the retreat at midnight. Why? Because she had to tie up all the blue ends, really stressed out, and so that she missed the first talk which I gave. <coughs> so she came for a quick interview so I could tell her just about the meditation retreat. And I said that the first thing to do is to actually relax your body, and you're exhausted. I could see that. So I gave her full permission that after breakfast she could go and take a nap until lunch. And after lunch she could go back to her bed in a dormitory and sleep until mid-afternoon. And that's what she did for the first two or three days. She didn't come to the morning talk, she hardly ever sat in the meditation hall, but she almost wore out the mattress and the pillow. That was just for two or three days. She was catching up on her sleep, which as a busy executive she never had the, right, the time to do. In the middle of the retreat she started, you know, she started feeling good again. Her energy levels came back. So then she started uh, coming to the morning talk. Still taking naps every now and again, but her energy levels came up. And so she was just meditating, listening to the talks like everybody else. For the last two or three days of the retreat, she just took off. Her meditation soared. She came from a very good space, but she was now relaxed. And she could get into some very deep meditations. Why? Because she knew how to be kind to her body. Second factor of the second part of the Eightfold Path. It's not an indulgence. It's the fact that you need to relax your body. After the Bodhisattva gave up all those ascetic practices, he decided to bathe, eat properly, sleep properly, and when he went to uh, Bodhgaya, he chose this beautiful park. Not like now, it's just so busy but a beautiful park with lots of trees, very few mosquitoes, with the wind, just a cool breeze coming down, the river, the Rangela, with this beautiful clear water from the Himalaya mountains. It was like an idyllic place. Sometimes when I look out my window, the Richmond Park, You're not in the middle of some waste dump, the Buddha actually chose a beautiful place to meditate, cool, comfortable, and even got a meal which was prepared for a heavenly being. Beautiful food, a nice safu to sit on, made of grass, under a cool, shady tree. That's where he chose to become enlightened. Does that mean anything to you? <laughs> In other words, he was looking after his body, relaxing it, making sure that he was avoiding the extremes of tiredness and pain, so he could be peaceful. So that starts to understand what um, the right effort is, or right um, restraint. Now, I'm just going to go a little bit over time, as usual. <laughs> when we talk about, are we okay for five minutes? Okay. <coughs> for the right <coughs> mindfulness, the seventh factor of the Eightfold Path, 
There is always a link, a segue between each of these factors and the next factor. You've restrained some things which excite you, the greed, the wanting, the ill will. And basically what I was saying, oh, this is sloth and torpor, the restlessness and the doubt, is basically restraining the five hindrances. It is one of the reasons why, in the four focuses of mindfulness, they are described as having restrained the five hindrances, you abide aware of the body, energized, knowing the person, what you're doing, and mindful. Having restrained the five hindrances, you abide aware of experience, Vedana, of the mind, chitta, mind objects, the four Satipatthanas. I focused here on the first part of this, one of the prerequisites, the preparations before you practice the Satipatthana, having restrained the five hindrances. That's the job of the previous factor, right restraint. And you understand where this comes from? The Pali words are loke abhija, don't, sorry, winaye, winaye, which is, means restraint, of loke abhija domanasang. Loke abhija is a synonym for the first of the five hindrances. Usually translated karma chanda about 60% of the time, about 40% of the time is called loke abhija. And domanasa is two suttas where it replaces vayapada, ill will. So these are bona fide synonyms for the first two factors of the, eight, of the first, two fact, first two parts of the five hindrances. And there is two main Satipatthana suttas in the Deegan Nikaya and the Majjhima Nikaya. Both suttas, they do have commentaries. In both commentaries to those Satipatthana suttas, they specifically mention that Vinaya Lokya Bijadamanasa is referring to restraining the five hindrances. It's a party idiom when you mention two of a well-known list, it includes everything else in that list. Five hindrances. So having restrained the five hindrances, then you do the Satipatthana. And that's where the first six factors of the Eightfold Path have to be done. So your five hindrances are restrained. And then you can be mindful mindful enough to practice the, uh, the Satipatthana. When I was even a student, one of the books which I first got from the library of the Cambridge Buddhist Society, there was only a few books, was the Satipatthana Sutta, translated uh, by, and I remember Sonatera, Somatera and somebody else. I remember reading the introduction and say these two monks had gone over to Burma because they knew that the Buddhists had said if you practice Satipatthana for seven days that you can become fully enlightened. And they thought, well, you know, we've got a busy life. We can make, say, 14 days. <laughs> Actually, they went for longer than that. And after about two weeks, three weeks, they decided they were getting nowhere. So instead of actually practicing more, they decided to translate the Pali into English. And that was their book. But when I read that, I thought, the Buddha doesn't um, make false claims. How come that they've been practicing for seven days and still not enlightened? <coughs> How many people have gone to Vipassana retreats, practiced Satipatthana? So many retreats and still not enlightened. Was the Buddha wrong? Or was it the case that people didn't follow the instructions? Or even read the instructions? The instructions were <coughs> to <coughs> restrain the five hindrances first of all, and then to the Satipatthana. Restraining the five hindrances is a prerequisite which many people miss. Which is why they get frustrated. So, to find out episode two, 
of the path of enlightenment. That is coming tomorrow. <laughs> so, 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 I will take maybe one or two questions which are fresh in people's minds on what I've talked today, but most hopefully you'll put those questions down on pieces of paper for this evening. Is there anything, quick one you want to ask about anything? Or should we leave it for this evening? Yeah. Um, can I ask about what you said uh, about restraining the the hindrances? Uh, restraints, it seems like quite quite a, quite a strong word. And is there not a risk of having aversion towards towards the the hindrances and not the um, If you do have aversion towards the hindrances, then you are you're supposed to be restraining aversion. Mm. So it's basically it's an oxymoron. So to have restraints, knowing what you're restraining, if you see any aversion, it doesn't work. If you don't have aversion towards the hindrances, you restrain them, lessen them. And a, a good example of that is that wonderful story. The story was actually based on a tale from the suttas, but I did embellish it a lot. And that was of the anger eating monster. It's in the Yaka Samyutta. But this was the story of a monster who came into an empress's palace when the empress was at the temple or doing something else. And this monster was so ugly, so smelly and so terrifying that the <coughs> guards and security who were supposed to stop these monsters coming into the palace they were so scared, they went into the broom cupboards, hid under the tables, behind the flower pots. They were terrified. And that allowed the monster to go right into the centre of the palace and sit on the Empress's throne. At that point, the security realised that the monster had gone too far. And so they warned the monster, Get out now! This is not your seat, this is the Empress, Empress's seat. Get out now! Those few unkind words, the monster grew a bit bigger, more ugly, more terrifying, and more stinky. And so they made even more threats. They got out sticks and swords, trying to get rid of this monster. But every unkind word, thought or deed, the monster just grew bigger in size, more ugly, more frightening, <coughs> more smelly. And when the Empress came back, the reason why the Empress was the boss was because she was the smartest. And she took one look at the situation and knew exactly what to do. By this time, that <coughs> monster was so huge that uh, one of the monks gave an example, I think, because Star, Star Wars, was it Star Wars? That was after I became a monk. This big slob called Jabba. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Bigger than Jabba. <laughs> <laughs> and was more frightening than Alien. That's supposed to be the most frightening. I've never seen Alien, but anyway. The most frightening monster coming out of Hollywood. No, no it's not frightening. More fr More frightening than Margaret Thatcher on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> Does that work? <laughs> that works, okay. <laughs> anyway. And a more stinky was the stage coming off this monster was so bad that the maggots crawling on its skin, they threw up. They vomited. Not even maggots. <laughs> could take the smell. <laughs> but the, Miss, the uh, Empress, she was so smart, she looked at this disgusting, violent, huge monster and said, welcome. Sincerely welcome. Thank you, monster, for coming into this palace. Why have you waited so long to drop by? Has anyone offered you a cup of tea yet? Or something to eat? A pizza? Because pizza actually comes in monster size. <laughs> anyway, to cut the story short, was so kind to this monster, every kind act 
word, or thought even, the monster kept shrinking. And there all the other guards, people who worked in the palace, they got the message. They gave him a foot massage, <laughs> a shoulder massage. These monsters have huge heads. Imagine the neck pain they must endure. <laughs> and they were so kind to the monster, eventually the monster vanished completely away. It's an anger-eating monster. You don't get rid of the hindrances by feeding them aversion. <laughs> you explain that. And then the hindrances start to disappear. <coughs> Interesting, beautiful stories. Great psychology as well from the Buddha. Get out of here, you don't belong. Makes it worse. So anyway, hope that sort of answers your question. Okay, so now it's five o'clock. What do we do now? Five past five. Oh, it's here, yeah. Your own meditation. A tea break at six to seven. Okay, another tea break. Wow, this must be UK. Optional. <laughs> 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 Sorry? Optional. Oh, that's optional, yeah, sure. And seven o'clock we meet. Seven o'clock again we meet for group meditation, eight, fifteen, question and answers. Mm. So this is your time for another sort of um, uh, an hour until the tea break. So, uh, if you need to stretch your legs, if you need to just take a glass of water to uh, meditate in your room or have a shower, whatever you wish to do, please do it. But please do it silently. So we do the sadhus? <laughs> you haven't done those yet. So after talks or, or formal um, discussions or formal <coughs> talks like the um, uh, teachings of the, the suttas, we usually give the three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> that energizes people, and that's traditional. If you want to ask after, and honestly, I think I mentioned about this monk Ajahn Singh Tong. That was actually in Gaia, wasn't it? Hmm? Gaya, not here, but in Gaia. Yeah, yeah. Because forest monks. Tradition. And I, after five years with Ajahn Chah, you were allowed to go wandering, visit other forest monks, see what they do. And this monk, Ajahn Singh Tong, he was so loved by the local village. You can understand why. The first time I went to visit him, when he gave the blessing after the meal, the standard blessing, Yata Wari Waha Pura Pari Parenti. But he did it totally differently. He went, Yata wari waha pora pari porenti sagarang ewa mewa ito dinang pet anagu baka iti dang. Every day you do it like that. <laughs> and when you live with him, he wasn't mad or crazy at all. He was, according to Ajahn Mahabur, he was one of the enlightened monks in Thailand. And you know, he had the nerve, the guts, <coughs> the wisdom to actually give whatever he did lots of energy. So everybody loved coming to listen to him. He was really one of the great monks. It was wonderful actually to see the differences in characters between all the great monks and nuns. No two alike. And some really good fun to hang around. <laughs> Ajahn Chah, he was just such a joker at times. <laughs> he had one of the great monks, the other monks in Thailand. Uh, oh, when well, he went to go and see one of these great monks, Ajahn Kao. And he said, What's it like, you know, being a teacher? He asked, Ajahn Kao asked Ajahn Chah. He said, Oh, it's just like being a monkey in a cage. <laughs> <laughs> People poke you, ask questions, <laughs> take photographs, <laughs> <laughs> feed you. <laughs> <laughs> I can sort of relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> but I just shall laughing. Okay, so let's go and um, whatever you need to do.